Um, I'm Chloe, I'm from Boston. Um, I'll, I will introduce each other. I'm Effie Kenigsberg from Mount Sinai in New York. I'm Holger Heine, I'm here from Boston. And, and so we did um, circulate some of the topics we wanted to uh, discuss, but we did try to summarize them around the following uh, outlines. We are trying to be, get, keep it a little structured so we have time to cover different topics. But of course, we welcome any input. There might be some topics we're not covering that you may be particularly interested in uh, discussing. Uh, we have two mics to circulate. This is meant, it's not meant for us to talk, but for this to be a productive discussion. Yeah, we have to say it's live stream, so we have to talk to the microphone. At all, yes. Um, and so we thought for the first 20, 25 minutes, uh, it'd be good going back to what Dana just uh, presented. Um, to, um, for those of you who are interested to share, to share what, what you're working on in like 30 seconds, so that it is two sentences, so we don't spend the whole session, each of us saying what we're doing, and perhaps defining the key questions you think are important for the IC community um, to answer. And so this is a chance for all of you to speak, and we can this way synergize or figure out how we can best synergize as a community. Do you want to start? Shall we get started? Okay. Yes, let's get uh, started. So we are up to doing a, an atlas of the BCI lineages, uh, BCI lineage. We will sample from different sites, uh, sites of the human body, mainly from the tonsils, bone marrow, and blood. We try to do that from the same individual. That not, it's not always easy. Um, we try to sample across age groups to make the atlas more complete. We started working on tonsils because there's a lot of data already out there for the for peripheral blood and, and bone marrow. So we have a specific focus on tonsil at the moment, and yeah. That's we're more the, than 30 we're seconds. The, we're in the data, <laughs> data generation phase. <laughs> Do you wanna, I guess you have one, yeah, you don't need to. I have to. one, I think. Uh, so I'm working, we are working on, um, uh, I'm a computational biologist, I work on uh, different human diseases, um, Crohn's disease, uh, lung cancer, and liver cancer, and the idea is to try to correlate or to find associations between different cell states and distributions of cell states in different tissues and clinical outcomes of disease. Okay, and uh, we have different type of efforts, one of which is building on the healthy blood atlas by analyzing 20 different type of disease in blood. Not, the goal here is not to map specific uh, disease, but actually to map the extended existing cell states in the blood, and we're doing this in the context of drug perturbation across human organs as well. Like That's the type of summary we want. Anybody else wants to share? And this is just meant to kind of help synergize and get a sense of the different uh, efforts that are going on around the world. Nobody wants to share? Come on, don't make yeah. me point you. Arita, I saw you. <laughs> Sorry. I guess you're doing a bit of everything. But 30 seconds summary of how you're contributing to the ICA effort. Oh, to the ICA? 30 uh, seconds. Okay, I, uh, prof oh my God. Um, I profile both uh, immune cells uh, from bone marrow and from uh, PPMCs as well as cord blood, but I also study a lot of tissues and um, uh, throughout the body, and we all know that immune cells are everywhere and are I very know. important, <laughs> so I think that will give us a good comparison about uh, different uh, tissue-resident immune cells. Yeah, so, yeah, and you also get the non-immune cells, which is actually helpful in modeling their interactions. Yeah. You gave me only 30 seconds. That's correct, because we don't want to spend the full sessions doing this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, actually, Sham, Unyang, and myself are part of the Asian network. We're trying to profile as many uh, immune cells across different populations. So it's more population genetic drug driven, single cell immune profiling. Uh, okay. a so bit, bit blood? Of, mostly, mostly blood? Yeah, peripheral blood for peripheral now. Blood. So mainly what you heard earlier with single cell EQTLs, trying to achieve um, a population level of immune cell. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And you may also, if you don't want to, or don't, you're not working on a particular system, you want to also share your thoughts about what are the important questions you think we should be answering. You know, please raise your hand. So I'm working in the Teichmann lab, and in Cambridge we have a collaboration with uh, CBTM, um, so which is um, um, 
biobank of um, organ donors, which has allowed us, in collaboration with two other labs, so Joan Jones and Mena Cladworthy, to collect up to 10 different tissues of a single individual where we are basically surveying the immune populations and their tissue adaptation signatures, as well as uh, clonality relationships between T and B cells in the different tissues. Right. Are you doing systematically the same 10 tissues across all individuals? When it's, when it's possible. possible. Very nice. Question, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Ménager, I'm a group leader at Imagine Institute in Paris, and uh, we've been uh, profiling um, um, PBMCs frozen from uh, rare monogenic uh, auto-inflammatory um, and autoimmune disorders. Uh, we're trying to identify pathological cell clusters to see if uh, the classical nosology could be better defined using molecular characteristics. And now we start applying machine learning methods to try to get into uh, transcriptomic networks attached to those different subgroups uh, that we've identified. Very nice. Is, is your effort more right now on uh, RNA profiling? Uh, so, yes, RNA? we've been uh, doing a site six or so single cell transcriptomic mm -hmm. with like hundreds uh, also of protein tags. And now we're also um, going into single cell ataxic and um, um, spatial transcriptomic. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Stefan Schack, and I'm a postdoc in Paul Thomas's lab at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Tennessee. Um, one of the big interests in our lab is profiling immune cells across different tissue types as well, and also in different pediatric cancers. Um, one particular focus of our lab is connecting TCR specificity with T cell phenotype under different conditions and across different tissues, and then also trying to definitively link which epitope those T cells are recognizing so we can more broadly understand. Um, how that shapes the phenotype. So you're mostly disease focused as well? Uh, we do a lot of normal, um, and we also do a lot of disease, uh, influenza, bacterial infections, uh, cancer, things like that. Yeah. Oh, can you pass the mic? My name is Christoph Bock. I'm at the Center for Molecular Medicine in Vienna. Um, I'm coordinating one of these newly founded, uh, funded EU consortia, and uh, the one I, I'm um, coordinating is on organoids. So you might ask, what am I doing here? Because organoids are absolutely free of immune cells, and there's some truth to it. On the other hand, I do think a lot of interesting stuff could could come out of the convergence of organoids and immune profiling because you can obviously do a lot of perturbations, CRISPR perturbations, stroke screens, etc. when you bring together organoids in vitro with, uh, with ex vivo immune cells. So are you tissue agnostic in your organoids or are so you focusing on specific ones? The goal of the, of the, the consortium is to kind of fill this gap. With, in the, in the human, cell, human cell atlas white paper there was written there would be an organoid cell atlas and somehow never, no, no one has really systematically picked up but on that. But you are. So now we kind <laughs> of went there to, to do it agnostically on the bioinformatics side, but obviously we have to start from somewhere. So we said we will start with colon and brain where we do 100 individuals each to have kind of power for variation, et cetera, um, and then uh, reach out to the community where other organ organoids are done. So if you do any interesting organoids, get in touch with us, and we would be very happy to kind of represent your data in the organoid cell atlas. So can you repeat your name for those that didn't hear so they reach out to you? Christoph Bock from Vienna. There you go. Thank you. Anybody around Christoph? Come on. No? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sc I'm scribing the sessions. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> um, it can also be just about a qu the questions, the key questions you think we need to answer. I, I just work on the data coordination platform. Well, what type of data would you like? <laughs> okay, no, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Ah, oh, thank you. And then I'll come to you afterwards. So I'm a bioinformatician from the Torino University. Our main question is uh, when we use, uh, we use a lot of, uh, let's say, public data for, for data analysis, we do mainly tool development. And the point is that is what we feel that is missing is a clear annotation of what you say is a cluster cell into a cluster definition, because the reproducibility of that data is nearly, I would say, impossible if you repeat even the same analysis by themselves, at least what we are actually 
phasing out. And so that would be a, 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 a critical, question, right? critical point in this, I mean, general point, but for sure for the immunological part that we are particularly interested in. Definitely an important question, and we're going to try to actually discuss this a bit more. But thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Hannah Levitin. I'm a PhD student in Peter Sims's lab, and we're co coordinating with uh, the Farber lab in addition to other labs to do what a lot of people have discussed here, which is profile immune cells in different tissues from organ donors. And we've specifically been focusing on T cells and T cell activation from those tissues um, and expanding our focus to looking throughout age. And we've recently started looking in uh, infant organ donors as well as adults. So do you systematically do, do the same organs in your infant organ donors and your adult? Because you are limited with the type of organs I think you can query, right, in your system. Yeah, we, we do the best we can. Um, you know, things like bone marrow or tonsil you can get really reliably. Um, we get a lot of lung and sometimes we can get gut, gut as well as uh, really reliably a lot of lymphoid um, organs. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Kurosai Parsi from Cambridge. Um, the, w one of the unique things about the immune system is that it's very dynamic, much mm -hmm. more so than other tissues. The hepat hepatocytes are hepatocytes, basically, and they, they don't change, at least in rapid time scales. But the immune system does. So my question is what we are doing to capture the, the demographics of the donors that actually may influence this um, this rapid change in order so that we can actually compare uh, an immune atlas from one patient to another. Right. So that is one unique entity or feature of the ICA. Yeah, uh, uh, the person next to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lars Welten, currently EMBL, but moving to CRG in Barcelona in January. Um, I worked on hematopoiesis and recently we've done an atlas of mesenchymal cells in bone marrow and mouse. And I was wondering whether um, mesenchyme, bone marrow mesenchyme is already a topic at the HC HCA. Every cells are important, so it's great you're looking who, into that. So who, who, does anybody know who is working on mesenchyme and bone marrow? Raise your hand if you are. I'm not, but like raise, no? Looks like you're the only one in this session, but you know. We have, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know about okay. online, oh, there's so, so many for online. So I can, I, I have an online question, but before to answer that, um, <laughs> I know we're working on making the HD registry searchable so that um, you could answer that question by you know, searching for who's interested in bone marrow, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so we have a, an online question um, from Ram Dasgupta, uh, who I think this must be for Christoph. Um, he wanted to know if someone can elaborate on the organoid immune cell co-cultures. Um, are the immune cells expanded ex vivo, and what about HLA matching? I guess that's a huge topic of, of research. So uh, the first studies that um, have where it was, I think for the most part, have used uh, for practical reasons organoids from different people than they used the, the immune cell populations. Uh, obviously, you would want to match that, although this is technically uh, challenging to do. Uh, but right now, this is, is very early stage in this field, and I wouldn't think much standardization has been done yet, they, uh, yet. It's, it's still very very much exploratory, perhaps even too early to really make a reference map, uh, a human cell atlas worthy reference map of it. But uh, this is kind of going in and early is fun. Yeah. Any, ah, thank you. Hi, I'm Shaheen Khan from UT Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas. Uh, I work on immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and uh, how the immune repertoire is in patients uh, to understand the response in toxicity. And uh, I wanted to ask if there is a uh, lead in this field in uh, ICA who is leading this effort across. Uh, so there's not a particular branch that actually only does um, this particular effort, I mean, there's of course a tumor um, cell atlas initiative that's more about response. Uh, I cannot speak for other myself. I lead a program specifically on toxicities that include 46 clinicians using the single cell multi-omics approach. But I you know if there's anybody else that works on this, these are the great opportunities to meet and actually figure out how we can best synergize. Yeah. 
Right, and my specific question is to understand uh, autoimmune events that are developing in response to immune checkpoint therapy and to identify biomarkers utilizing single cell approaches. So that's the question you're tackling, it's a very good one. <coughs> I guess more of a technical question and discussion I would like to raise is, I guess many of people may be interested in TCR or immune checkpoints, which then allows um, VDJ sequencing or five prime based strategies have been quite useful. Um, so our lab is very much interested in cage technology or the studying of transcriptional start sites and looking at both coding and non-coding RNAs. So I just want to get a discussion later on if how we can further leverage this five prime strategy, not just on TCRs, but also in transcriptome, and trying to gather a um, more comprehensive data set to have a better annotation on, on genes, uh, including non-coding RNAs. Okay, so, so the, back to the angle of more multi-omics, different type of angles, we'll get there for sure. We have five more minutes. Oh, oh yeah, please. Do you have a, oh, we lost the other mic. I give it away. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Andrea Radke, and I'm at the National Institutes of Health with Dr. Ron Germain, and we do a lot of confocal microscopy of various organs with an emphasis on the immune system. And two things that I would like to talk about is just how the source of the tissue can impact, um, whether it's surgical resection or through organ donation, how that has an impact on immune cells and immune signaling. Some of the you know, we know the steroids that go into before um, organ procurement. Also, how do we obtain those really hard to extract cells and understand, you know, myeloid cells or dendritic cells and so on? Because um, we're always under sampling with some of those single cell RNA seq technologies, how we really capture them uh, without altering their transcriptional state. Oh, you're here. <laughs> hey, I'm giving you space. <laughs> My name is Philip Brel from Lund University, and I'm interested in the reprogramming of non-immune cells into immune cells. So, um, directly from fibroblasts or mesenchymal stem cells into uh, dendritic cells or hematopoietic stem cells, and profiling these processes at single cell level. So the atlas for me is useful, so we can cross compare our data to identify which cell we're generating by reprogramming. So you're defining uh, how you would be using the IC, right? It becomes your reference data set. Really, you sit at the far back? <laughs> Get close to it. <laughs> Hi, I am Alvaro Martinez, and I come from Tenex Genomics. So I'm interested here in building tools, obviously. So that's why I'm here to listen to you, what's the best tool, the next thing that we could build. And I have been involved in the data release of CD8. That's why I'm interested in immunology. So we were profiling four different donors at uh, the multiomics level. So we're doing all the assays that we have, including uh, PMHCs. So uh, yeah, if you have any question or anything, just talk to me later in the break. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else wants to give any, we, ah, oh, thank you. I'm Sonia McParlin. I'm from the University of Toronto and Toronto General Research Institute. And as part of the transplant program, we're looking towards reprogramming the immune cells to promote tolerance and tissue regeneration in transplanted organs. So how are you hoping to uh, use the data from the IC or what type of questions are you trying to answer? Well, we want to look at whether different T cell clonotypes are promoting rejection, whether different T cell populations are promoting regeneration and whether we can use those to um, in ex vivo perfusion systems to reprogram organs before we transplant them. Anybody else wants to give input on the type of questions they're hoping to answer for the IC or how they hope to use the uh, IC data set beyond their reference? Oh. Hi, Eva Tolosa. I'm an immunologist and uh, not so much in sequencing, but I have a basic question. So to everybody, when you choose donors, do you consider ongoing processes? So, I mean, somebody may have some asymptomatic CMV infection that will completely shift the immune system. I mean, 
are, do you have any way of detecting, and I'm not going, don't, don't tell me that just the serology should do, but I mean, do you have any parameters that you make sure, well, this guy has an incredibly activated immune system at this moment, so it cannot be considered a normal donor, or how do you how go do you with define this? healthy? Yeah. Oh, exactly. How do you define healthy? Yeah, that's a big but question of debate. Is there such thing? <laughs> <laughs> And you, you can actually get some sense based on um, TCR sequencing, but uh, to some extent, but um, I don't want to be the one answering all these questions. Yes, Jordi wants to give some insights. Thanks, Jordi. Uh, uh, currently directing the Institute of uh, Girona Biomedical Research Institute here north of Barcelona. So along, this, uh, along the lines of this question, and also the one about the demographics of the samples, so I don't know, the hygiene hypothesis as well, like uh, where people come from, and if uh, you know, you're collecting samples from people who have lived their whole life in, their city, in the city or in the country site, I don't know if that could be something that could be a question that at some point you could even consider, like bringing some light. I don't know, it's no, very much debated, like this hygiene hypothesis. But, uh, yeah. Well, we can probably switch to the next topics, but like throughout the session, if you want to give specific input about the questions and the queries we should be answering, and we'll get back to your question right away because it's part of the next slide. Um, uh, so about the roadmap of like what's a healthy tissue dose of, that's like very overwhelming questions, but basically it goes back just to the blue uh, question and all the rest are like subtopics and this is straight from the Google Doc that uh, we shared so uh, as Donna mentioned of course if we had unlimited budget it wouldn't be a problem but we do have limited budget so given a limited budget what are you prioritizing uh, to make what you would believe is a complete first draft for an ICU related projects uh, and are you uh, focusing on you know specific type of individuals gender age range uh, are you prioritizing certain types of measurements? And then you, we can get, you can get in any of these sub-questions which were raised um, in previous presentation, number of donors, gender, ethnicity, geographical um, location, which relates to some of the hygiene hypothesis that Jordi just mentioned, uh, number of cells, how do you sample, trinatomical regions. I mean, these are vast questions, even more so important for the immune system because you find it in every single organ. Uh, and to go back to like how do you define healthy, surely hope that as we profile more and more individuals, you'll start seeing some of these outliers. So it may be hard through serology or just to see your sequencing to capture them. But as we combine all of the data sets, you should start being able to see some of these more outlier individuals. And it's actually okay that they have a perturbation and they have a CMV infection because that will help identify some of these different cell states that emerge. You actually, in my humble opinion, need to perturb the system to actually be able to uh, identify all existing cell states, which you may not capture in a state of com completely normal. I don't think there's healthy, but I think there's a range of normal. Um, that is absolutely true. But so my question is, is um, how the differences that you have due to disease, and so, I mean, I don't know what the budgets are for the projects. So you can sequence probably a limited amount of donors. If you sequence 10 and you have three with disturbances that you do not know which ones those are, um, it just may be difficult to make sense. I totally agree yeah. with you, disturbances are very important. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I come from flow cytometry, so we are used to see how T cells are, I'm a T cell immunologist, and I can tell more or less by sight if there is something wrong by looking at the fax profile. I can do the but tremor you can do this from the, the yeah. transcriptome probably. Yeah, yes. you need the well, actually now with the tremor specific uh, reagents, you can actually barcode them and include them in your single RNA sequencing, but then you would need them for you know all the different bugs. I mean, I cannot speak for others, like yeah. in our case, the so, healthy donors do have to fill out a 10 page questionnaire. It's not. Perfect. So you, you get some information. We do, I mean, for us. So I think that the question here is about prioritization and about how, to, how we sample the distribution of patients, about disease, of disease and uh, how deep. Well, and this is healthy. Disease is the next one. Yeah, but, <laughs> we, we, but we discussed the, yeah. the, uh, the range of healthy and 
that it's not so clear. So, and so disease is starting here somewhere. So, and this sampling is something that uh, we need to prioritize here. And I think that this discussion is, should touch these questions. So yeah, so in our case, we actually think it's kind of easier to, uh, to build an atlas of like uh, pathological cells. And what we've observed, we are actually using, uh, we're actually making cross comparison between, between different autoimmune, autoinflammatory disease. And each subgroup can serve as a controls for, for the other one by comparing uh, disease with, with, with an excess of type 1 interferon to disease with maybe uh, lupus or other things. Then at some point we start wondering maybe to understand of physiopathology, we don't need so much of so-called healthy because just making cross comparison across different diseases can solve a problem. So that would be one point. Um, and, and why? We've seen, for example, uh, we don't need to do batch correction. Then I was talking about batch co correcting batch effect, which can lead to a lot of change, which is true. You always need to do batch correction for so-called healthy, but in all case, if patients are suffering from an excess of type 1 interferon, uh, after running on Tenix, we see almost the exact same profiles of their PBMCs without batch effect correction. Why? Because thousands of genes are deregulated by type 1 interferon. So that's why I think mm. somehow we need to process both healthy and, uh, and pathological um, ICA uh, all together. And maybe from the disease, we're going to be able to establish a better what should no. be normal immune, immune uh, system. I have a follow-up question because you do yeah. monogenic traits. Yeah. So do you use some of the clinical information to help inform which subset you should be enriching for, or do you systematically do unbiased analysis of yeah. your PBMCs? Yeah, we decided to do um, unbiased analysis of PBMCs for the reason that maybe we've been focusing, for example, on a disease we think it's on the T cells, and maybe, maybe there's other sub-cell types interesting, such as monocytes or DC. Um, we have also diseases where, for example, there's no T cells, and we start asking how all the other cells look like when there's no T cells since, uh, okay. like, an individual is born. So unbiased, and you systematically do the same number of cells per individual. Yeah, we try. Uh, go back to the yeah. sampling. Yeah, we try. Yeah. In our rare disease projects, we actually do it differently. We use the information of which cell types are effective, but we don't discard the kind of the rest. So what we would normally do if we have like two or three cell types that we think are affected, we would fuck sort those out and then uh, take 25% each of maybe three different cell types and then sp uh, uh, spike, spike in 25% uh, of unsorted stuff. And that gives us the depth, and then put all of this with no further site seek or other barcoding on the 10x, because that comes all, all from the same individual, and then sort it out in the computer. And that would essentially bias uh, the 10x analysis to give us depth on where we expect phenotype, while also not missing out on, on the kind of unknown unknowns uh, by having a bit of, of background plus it. Uh, having the kind of the rest of the supposedly yeah. healthy or unchanged immune report, uh, cell types in there also simplifies this batch uh, simplifies batch correction but because we would then batch correct only on what we think are unaffected cells, uh, kind of calibrate on on those, and uh, this is why uh, this way we don't kind of batch correct away the the disease phenotype. But you don't. Because you could actually, that's actually a clever way of enrichment, but you could also, even if it's the same individual, barcode it. And then you could get an enrichment of your 25% and actually deconvolve, but that's currently not what you're doing. So what I'm saying is uh, if people should not be deterred from this type of strategy if they don't want the additional complexity of site seek or any form of barcoding. Even if you don't do barcoding, that actually works quite nicely because yeah, yeah. you can, in the computer says, put this apart. Obviously, as SiteSeq becomes absolutely standardized or other types of multiplexing strategies, you can as well barcode, yeah. but you don't so need good, to. It's a good insight. I have a question regarding sure. subclinical immunity. Mm -hmm. How is there a, there is healthy and then there is clinical disease, but there is a. There's a range there's in between. 
there is goes a back patients, to point. Uh, that do not have symptoms, clinical symptoms. And uh, I think it is essential to have that category and it's going to be varied depending on the disease. And yeah, I so don't think... You're uh, are you a clinician? I am not. Oh, you're not. <laughs> but okay. I work with clinicians, so... I don't know if there's clinicians yeah. here, but um, raise your hands if you want to give input. I, I mean, completely agree. I think it is important to collect as much metadata as we can on these individuals and to report alongside. And in some cases, because as she was mentioning, disease or not diagnosed or it's like has not yet reached a peak, you may not detect it up front. And so this is where the meta-analysis will help identify such individuals. And if we have metadata, we may be able to kind of find correlates. And as you mentioned, despite the patient or the normal healthy individual filling a 10-page thing, it may not be... Absolutely. Right. Uh, he may not be aware of uh, yeah. you know, what's going on in his immune system. Yeah. Yeah, we need the historical medical records of the but patient, and usually we don't have it. Yeah, like but on top of it, yeah. she's saying that even that may not be capturing an underlying um, immunological response that may be minor. Yeah, you're right. It's like as we uh, agglomerate all of the data, we'll start seeing these slightly outlier individuals come up. But, yeah. So anybody else want to give some thoughts on what you think is a complete first draft? <coughs> How are you going about it? Number of cells, individuals, are you considering ethnicities? I just want to emphasize the slide that Dana Pear showed this afternoon yeah. about dendritic cells, and they yeah. are very rare if you look at PBMCs, but you can actually enrich them and see even multiple states or matter states. Or, uh, so question, I guess, to this group is, do we want to further zoom in to particular cell types and do additional rounds of single cell profiling to build the build a right. Atlas 1.0? So how do we go beyond the knowns, right? Yeah. That the unknowns may likely be more rare. So how do we think about enrichment? Yeah, so should we div divide and conquer this or should we you know, focus on just general platform at 1.0? At 2.0, we start talking about higher resolution of cell types. It's a good question. I think we already have examples within this room of people doing specific lineage. I mean, Hoker, <coughs> I don't want to point to you, but like, because it's very focused, taking notes, but you're doing B cells, right? Yeah. When we sample from the tonsils, but most of the cells are B cells. But for the blood and for the bone marrow, we, we enrich definitely. Yeah. And for we want to be chosen approach that goes very deep into into our samples. So we do like 20,000 cells per donor. We do few donors in general, so we balance between genders. Uh, we do very few aging groups, but we decided to go deep in terms of cell numbers. That hopefully gives us the resolution to define a draft of that organ, and then to connect the lineages. So we try to sample from tonsils and from bone marrow the matched peripheral blood monolithic cells. Um, yeah, because all three is difficult to get. So in your case, for a first rep, you're saying it's m your strategy is to do more deep, more cells, less individual we for less a individual first rep. A lot of cells. We do also attack seek and spatial. Spatial on the tonsils and attack seek on all samples. So the, that approach is to go as deep as possible with the budget available. So. so sorry? We do BCF for selected samples. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is one so what's what's your magic number of cells? Always one million. One million is your magic number. <laughs> Who says more or less? One million for B cells. One million for B cells yeah. across all organs B or for tonsils? Yeah. That's that what? what the budget would allow at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but if we would have more uh, more budget, I would rather go to more individuals. Maybe less cells even than more individuals. That would be my next best choice. So how many are individuals? Like, what's the number of individuals? Depending on the budget, yeah. No, no, yeah. but you said one million, so... Yeah. so no, at the moment we do a few. Probably the end, then you would go up to uh, up to 100 to get mm -hmm. some depth there. But, yeah. So, so a little bit like... Different phases that you go. So you, you go from 10 to 100 and then yeah, mm -hmm. go from there. And how many yeah. do you Sequence of 20,000 reads per cell. So Deep enough. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's where the 10x library is basically saturated, or starts saturating, especially for B cells. So if we would go deeper, we would not get more, much more information, and yeah, we'd probably waste the budget. Uh, budget. So, so, Ari, this morning you showed this uh, strategy, oh. right, of like pilot, small number. Uh, I forgot the name. One was validation, one was... Uh, pilot, deep, and, and breath. Yeah, so breath the... And 
So depth and breadth. Right. So how many for depth and how many for breadth? And yes. <laughs> I didn't put numbers. I know you didn't put numbers. I'm asking. <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a really tough question. So I know. For, um, for ducks, we don't think you need that many individuals overall. So maybe four to eight for, because uh, it has two uh, phases. One is sort of the training and the other one is validation. So I don't think you need that many. For four to eight, but you're doing across all like but you're sections. Doing a lot of sections, you're really going deep. So um, I think that would give quite a lot of information about. What, uh, what areas to actually sample more, uh, what are the important technologies, what should we actually do across these, um, in, in the later phase where the idea is to actually sample a lot of uh, the breadth, a lot of individual across like very specific. So like hundreds? For the breadth? breath. Um, it depends what you want to do. For GWAS, I would say hundreds. Yeah. Somebody, ah. Question to Holger and everyone else. Uh, you said a million. Like, if a million cells were cheap, what would we do that we are not doing at the moment? Like, what would, like, if you could have a million cells for 20,000 or 40,000, or I don't know, what would dramatically change? Well, the million is then spread across age groups and donor standards. So it basically breaks down to 100,000 cells per, per condition or category. But and that's just but more of the same, like something completely new that would be feasible if, if, it, if kind of costs drop 50-fold or 100-fold. Or if you go deeper, you would not expect to identify new cell types, but you would probably gain power in distinguishing between variants between the two conditions. So if you go deep per age group, you would have more power to define difference between age groups. I think I mean, that you, can you could identify more subtle differences uh, that could be clinically relevant, but uh, the effect size in terms of uh, uh, trans transcriptomics uh, could be very small. Oh, wait, we have one here. Is this on? Here. Yeah, it's on. I believe you can oh. shed more light on genetics. Uh, and ethnicity if you had more dollars and uh, how you would emerge that data set with single cell. That's one of my perspectives. Okay, Sam? I just, my goal would be for 2.0 or 3.0 or something that you can take, you know, any, either the whole immune system or you can take any tissue with all the immune components resident and then you could basically push it in any direction in terms of different kinds of stimuli, right? Right now we're pretty limited in terms of what kinds of conditions, what kinds of models we have of different immune responses. And ideally you'd really wanna look and see what, you know, how do things shift? And if you could, if, you ha if it was really cheap, then I guess we would have much better sense of what the full range is of, you know, what do these, what does the system look like under really different kinds of perturbations and conditions? And ideally you would also synchronize it better with uh, non-immune cells, right? Res other tissue, you know, tissue cells. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. What do you think 1.0 looks like? Because <laughs> nobody's entering really. So I mean, what <laughs> I, I missed the beginning, so I'm, well, uh, that's okay. really me on the spot. Um, uh, I mean, well, what do we have? Uh, we ha have have. Is it one million cells with a specific organs? Is it like? Is it just we've done pilot and then deep uh, analysis of four individuals for specific organs? Did we sample throughout an organ? Did we do just single cell RNA or did we do mul multiple modalities? Is it only healthy? Do we have disease as part of 1.0? Yes. yes, all of this. All? I mean, I think <laughs> it would be ideal to uh, have a at least one setting, maybe it would be nice to have more than one organ, right? Where you yeah. have at least really complete immune sampling. Within a certain uh, frequency range, like right. as Aviv mentioned, we right. statistically yeah, define it's, it's it. statistically within, I mean, that's fine. That's, that's all very quantifiable, right? So you mm. can say we've detected cells that are present at least at this frequency. And ideally, I don't know. I, I mean, then you have to decide whether you care about individuals, genetics, multimodality, different conditions. Etc. What me, do you care? I, I mean, it's all going to be useful. I guess multimodality is nice, but I also, 
you know, where is a spatial resolution, but I, for me, it's not really that interesting until you start really looking at perturbations and conditions, and so for me, that's really important. Okay. Oh, thanks to you, would you pass? Well, honestly, I have to say that I didn't do any single cell experiment yet, but uh, I've been discussing with Holger some experimental design, of, and, and what I was, uh, bit, well, not shocked about is that the, the sensitivity of the essays is, is so low, so that you capture just a very f small fraction of the transcriptome in your cells. So even if you would s sequence a lot more cells or a lot more, uh, or a lot more reads per cell, I think this is still a very clear limitation of the techniques we have right now, and I think there should be efforts to, to, optimize, to optimize this. So you're saying um, not necessarily uh, pushing multi-omics measurements to get a different view of the cells, but actually focusing on improving specific technologies to get more transcripts? That would be where exactly, you would Exactly, to, to get more transcripts or to, to make it possible to have like panels of, of genes that you want to investigate with a much deeper sensitivity uh, in light of a more global transcriptome at the same, at the same time, <coughs> just to... Uh, although I don't know if there's also possibilities to impute specific uh, uh, programs of RNA expression if you have like sufficient number of cells to do so. But, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, <laughs> I, I think since we are a immune ICA or immune cell atlas group, but there are other breakout sessions that are ongoing with different tissues, and they're probably profiling immune cells mm -hmm. as well. Um, perhaps it would be a good idea as a group here to come up with guidelines or suggestions to different uh, ATLAS members how they should profile their immune cells, uh, resident immune cells, and perhaps ask some requirements as to functional studies if necessary. Um, so I thought since we are all interested in immunology yeah. yet, yeah. There are resident immunes that are being discussed some other breakout sessions. So as a group here, it would be good to propose a way to um, help collect the data together. Most so definitely. So there's like the computational aspect, but there's also the experimental aspect, which yeah. you're alluding to. Yes. Do you have yourself some specific pointers? Uh, no. no? <laughs> well, I, hopefully I'm more interested in peripheral, but again, yeah. I think we should take no, advantage a, of other... I think it's a very good point. Assets. Yes. So I think this raises a very important point because what I think going back to that version 1.0 uh, thing is that you know one thing which would be really good from the atlas is that we get unified definitions of different cell types, rare cell types across different tissues. Because for me myself, I'm coming from the dendritic cell field, and the field was very hampered by the way that you know everyone had their own definitions of dendritic cells for like ages, like way beyond Singer cell, and. Um, Basically, if we kind of can come to a point where, you know, a CDC1 or a CDC1 is maybe a bad example, but CDC2s are CDC2s in the lung, there are CDC2s in the blood, and there are CDC2s in the gut, and we can have like modules which describe them very well, this atlas would be extremely useful um, across all lineages because people would finally know what the other person is really talking about without kind of explaining too much in detail um, in terms of gene modules and markers and flow cytometry and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And as an immunologist, um, we, I mean, I imagine, I mean, I know you appreciate the, the function and the validation, and which should be part of the s cell type and state definition in immune cells. So do you have any thoughts on the type of coordinated framework we could do to kind of help define these CDC2 across? Is it the same thing between lung and, and on the gut? I mean, there will be obviously transcription heterogeneity because there's tissue imprinting, but yeah, that yeah. is something which this atlas can really do is first of all define common modules and then kind of branch out from that and defining tissue specific gene modules which define, let's say, lung, lung dendritic cells or lung CDC2s. And from there, you could kind of have an additional layer on that and you have a common set of perturbations or, or, is, or stimulations where you say, okay, like a lung dendritic cell. Uh, reacts like that, whereas a bone marrow derived dendritic cell reacts like that, and we, you then again can build classifiers out of that, really um, again having common modules which are across all CC2s and then accounting for tissue specificity um, uh, in other classifiers which kind of would give you an additional layer, but I think the first layer on 1.0 what we should aim for really is define all cell types across all tissues 
in a certain set of individuals um, with common nomenclature because yeah. that's the basis on what we work on, especially as immunologists. Absolutely, but I guess another way of asking my question for 1.0, because you're describing modules, do you think RNA would be sufficient for uh, 1.0, or I go back to like uh, multi-omics, like are there other measurements that you think would be helpful for 1.0 to kind of define like a, a partial view of the cell? I think the combination of RNA and ATEC would probably be a good thing because ATEC, you know, gives a kind of potential which would be then be very important for the perturbation layer. But but uh, I guess these two layers for me maybe have protein if possible because you can connect it to flocytomony, which is ubiquitous in immunology, right? So uh, that would be good. But uh, so protein attack RNA. I'm going to cite you on this. Yeah, nice to have, but you know, let's, let's get the basics right and then we... That's 2.0? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then we go back down. I have a slightly different take on what 1.0 should look like, and it's not specific to the immune cell atlas, but there's no computational breakout session, so I'll bring it up here. Uh, it's um, maybe when we have 1 million cells, and I guess some people already have 1 million cells, we'll see that the cells are sitting in a continuum of states yeah. mm -hmm. and that uh, we'll realize we simply can't agree on what a cell type, which, how many cell types there are because it's just a, a smear, right? And so I wonder if we should already start thinking about what language we'll use rather than the language of discrete cell types. We have a language of a continuum of cell states and then actually a quantitative descriptor saying the cell is X percent down the road between this state and the, this landmark and that landmark. Yes. A, as a data-driven, I, I, I think as the data accumulate, our data-driven definitions of cell types or cell states will start to get stronger and stronger. And then we'll feel maybe that the cell types we defined earlier based on facts gating were somewhat arbitrary. Yes, yeah, I mean, we're gonna get there, so keep these thoughts on, but we can obviously jump in the conversation because we do have, uh, I think, we have some time to talk about data harmonization and how do you define a cell type and states, but it's good, people are jumping in. So maybe we can, I think <coughs> there's someone here and then Sam. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out that I think the constraint here isn't only monetary, there's also certain types of samples that are more easier, more difficult to get. So, for example, when we work on infants, those samples are very precious. Um, there are very few infant donors who pass all of our quality control. Um, and obviously, also, those organs are in a lot of demand for transplant. So I think one thing to consider in a 1.0 versus a 2.0 is to what extent a 1.0 should be only common samples versus carefully chosen exemplars of certain more difficult to acquire samples that can be used down the line. Okay, so and, and you're suggesting maybe less individuals, more focus uh, organs, right? Nobody has, uh, I'll have Sam talk, but nobody talk um, also about ethnicity, geographical regions, but yeah, Sam had a comment about maybe cell states. Oh, I just wanted to totally second what he said and say that I think I'm already working on it myself, and I think it's, uh, I mean, there are very, there are, you know, systems and physics and other areas where there's like very natural continua, and so we can absolutely do that, and also it's going to be important for describing perturbations and the effects. You know, there's a um, kind of a balancing between how much do you think of the system as getting pushed in a certain direction in terms of what cells are doing versus the proportions, and when you start thinking continuously, those actually kind of intersect a little bit, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's a. I just wanted to second it. Yeah, and I agree that we need better language, and that he could be. Uh, one of the contribution of the first uh, version of the atlas because like all of these programs that we now define reveal could be an example of one aspect of these languages yeah, so my question is for the 1.0 um, yeah what we should focus on like I don't think there's only one ICA that can be built you know there's like first differences like a child versus adult you know it's as we said the uh, immune system is very dynamic so uh, we study uh, mostly disease affecting child, and we can tell that there's a lot of difference when you uh, checked uh, PBMCs from, a, from a even healthy adult to an healthy child. So there's some you know, antigen and maturity and stuff. And also the difference between uh, PBMCs and tissue. 
right? Um, I guess uh, the, the profile of cells uh, you obtain in, in uh, circulating blood could be rather different from a tissue. So my questions are for the 1.0, should we, should we do PBMC or tissues or both? And then should, should we make a distinction between child and adults? Because otherwise we could, uh, I think that would be wrong to try to put everything in the same batch and try to derive one, like only one, um, one ICA for the 1.0 because then we'll, we'll get a lot of confounding factors and things that could uh, mislead people. Well, I think given the different groups we heard about today, there's already blood and tissue ongoing that's going to be released for the 1.0, so that get to that. And there's a group in New York doing pediatrics and yourself. So yeah, I but do, should we, we but my question, should we try to gather all those data in one atlas, which I, sh I think we should not? Or should we already propose like some sub I see atlas like <laughs> pediatric versus adult and um, blood versus tissues. Yep. Okay, I'm going to switch the topic back to <laughs> um, the gentleman down there was talking about that uh, he thinks the RNA and ATAC seq are two very important uh, multi-omic measurements to make, and then protein if you could do it or connect it with flow cytometry. And I don't know if you guys already talked about site seq earlier because I came in kind of late, but that's obviously it's multi omics measurements. Yeah, the multi right, right. So you're so saying we should do site seq? Yeah, I mean it's an obvious <laughs> way. It's a very easy way to do both the protein and RNA at the same time because you're already doing an assay and it's very easy to stain your cells ahead of it, and so you get yeah. two layers. And then once we can get to a level where you know detecting uh, protein in a more unbiased fashion, um, you can start making a lot more conclusions and, and really make new discoveries from that. I guess one thing about the IC group is that w we could come up with your help with a uh, standardized panel mm -hmm. that all could use for their IC project, mm -hmm. which would be helpful and probably more cost effective. Sorry I put you on the spot. Hi. Back to the pediatric samples. Um, so we have run a study on different ages, and actually a one-year-old child is completely different from a five-year-old. And so you would need many, many samples to get a figure of that. And the question is, do these children, do they have different cell types? I don't think so. So they have different proportions. They will have more recent thymic immigrants. They will have less virtual memory cells. But at the end, it's the same cell types. This is something that we can address with flow cytometry once we know the marker. Uh, more. Yeah. Because I, I really think it's very, very difficult, and it's very difficult to get samples from children. I mean, I totally agree. So maybe what it could make sense, and I, I don't know, if somebody doing cord blood. So cord blood, it's supposedly, so before there are many stimuli, of course it will be affected by what has happened during pregnancy, but cord blood could tell us one starting point information, and then what happens um, in the next times, I think, can be more defined with less cost. I think it's a lot of effort to try to characterize the pediatric samples with this very precise technique. So uh, you're, it's an yeah. opinion. Yeah, no, I don't know. It's, a, it's a good point. I mean, there's core blood data that it's already been released on the HC portal. And so what you're suggesting, I guess I'm stretching for what you just said, is maybe for 1.0, uh, there be more focus on adult and less on pediatrics, and that we build from it because we're going to need more granularity. So. 2.0 and 3.0 could kind of start zooming in at different windows of time? I, I think, I mean, the adult would be definitely the starting point. Core blood could also be probably 1.0, um, but the different ages, and uh, I think this is really one step farther. And it applies also for actually very old, actually. So for core blood, I would definitely have a really large data set for core blood. It's on the... Um on the portal. It's on the DCP uh, portal, so you can definitely go and, and look at the data, but actually the data is very different between uh, different cord bloods. It's, it's completely, because there are a lot of uh, factors that influence what would be on the, what will happen in the cord blood, right? What's the length of the pregnancy, um, how old really the fetus was, things like that, because these all affect the because the immune system is still <coughs> developing at that point, so they're a little bit different than one another. So this got me think about proportionality. So is a 1.0, do we want to determine, and it's a very long shot, but do you want to determine the ideal number of cell population as a definition of 1.0? So 
you expect 20% T cells, 10% B cells. As a measure of what is a very difficult yeah. question, what is, what is normal, right? Because uh, so, it sounds like aging and, and infections and cancer can perturb that proportionality. And that could be, rather than number of cell types that, that defines the atlas, but rather defining the proportionality of the immune cells. So, so per lineage instead of cell type, because we could, yes. that's an excellent point, but you could kind of make it, um, you can make it broad, the point you're making, in terms of proportion per lineage, or you can make it more specific as we define types and we figure out these proportions. Or both, yeah. Within exactly. like an expected frequency, let's say, of 5% or something. Yes. Um, uh, so it, we've been involved in supercentenarian studies where we profile mm -hmm. immune cells of 110 years or older in Japan. And it's, again, the cell types are the same, but the proportionalities are, are vastly different from, the, from their descendants. So uh, again, I think coming up with a, a, some number or criteria, I know it's debatable, no, it's but good. I think something in that extent would be very helpful. And then to your earlier point, integrating it with uh, the data from these organ-specific effort yes. right, to kind of help feed that information for 1.0. Yeah. Yeah. You asked the question about ethnicities and how they should be represented. For 1.0 yes, or 2 or Yes, I think or three. it's very important. And my perspective is that uh, we should try and make an effort to include as many ethnicities as possible so that uh, people who are predisposed genetically to several autoimmune diseases could benefit from 1.0 atlas and they don't have to wait. So all ethnicities can derive the benefit. And maybe question to Jay, how do you solve that in the Asia atlas? Yeah, I was going to okay. say the same thing. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I'll, I'll speak for Jay and, and the other people in the consortium. So I'm actually presenting tomorrow on genetic diversity uh, in the single cell field. Uh, I fully agree with the previous person, I think it was you, who said we really need to involve as many populations as possible from as, you know, as many countries as possible and as many parts of the country as possible in this to see how diverse immune cell states and cell types, cell proportions are and so on. And so I, I don't want to give too much of a preview of what I'll say tomorrow, but basically there are efforts in um, many, many different parts of the world to bring many countries in. The hardest thing is to bring in some, some data from places where single, the single cell research is not that well established yet. But uh, that is the focus of the equity group in the Human Cell Atlas, to try to in include them and define ways in which we can bring them in. But that's really an important goal, I think, of this atlas. So I have a, since, and without stealing your thunder for tomorrow's presentation, uh, how are you defining ethnic background, ethnicity? Because, I mean, there's like a genetic component to it, but like, you know, you need to still do some grouping um, for like at least an initial draft? That's an excellent question. So I guess you can take the human genetics approach and say, if you do a, a T-SNE of uh, genotypes, how many clusters do you find and so on? Well, not that T-SNE is best for clustering, but, uh, but we're not going about it quite like that. Right? We're yeah. just trying to cover so different geographical, geographical areas. Okay. And then in the process, you'll get a fairly large genetic diversity. You'll also get you know, even same, roughly same gene pool, but different lifestyles or different geographies, you'll get some differences, and I think they should all be studied. So should we genotype everybody that we're profiling? I guess it gets to That's this That's what point. we're doing. Okay, so genotyping. Yeah, I, is there, no? Speaking of <coughs> diversity, I think this is not just genetic diversity. I don't think it's going to work just to take kind of people from New York uh, who are from all different parts of the world and... But that's not what they're doing. No, I'm not <laughs> saying this. Or people from Singapore or whatever. Uh, I think you're doing the right thing. You're going to where, uh, where these people actually have lived for, for many generations because I do think that, uh, especially as we're looking at the immune system, environment is such a big factor. And I, I think... Uh, and um, the, if you just do for the gen go for the genetic variation in 
uh, in a place where people have migrated to, that might give you a very clean signal on the genetics, but it ignores another major factor of, of diversity, which is nutrition, environment, pathogenic exposures, etc. So how would you suggest, Christoph, we collect that information? Oh, go ahead. I think the big question is how to do ethical, informed consent in areas where you would essentially, you don't want to just kind of fly in, collect samples, fly out. That's, that's unethical for, for many reasons. On the other hand, you also don't want to just go to people who have migrated into places where you have all the infrastructure in place. And I think you have much more experience going in, into, the, uh, into places and doing kind of ethically acceptable research there. So I'm very curious to hear your answer to that. Thank you for the question. So maybe I should have clarified. It's not just genetic diversity. We are also looking at same, you know, rough ethnicity but different parts of the world, living in different parts of the world to look at the influence of environment. And the other thing you mentioned is kind of the colonial aspect of flying in, taking samples, flying out, and uh, uh, you know, using their materials and their effort for your analysis and then what do they get in return. But the single cell field is, I, I won't say I have done that, but I'm my colleagues in, so with, with Jay and some of our colleagues uh, in, uh, in this consortium, they are epidemiologists and the epidemiology community has a lot of experience of this, of collecting samples from uh, uh, various parts of the globe, including places that don't have their own research, right? And at least the principle there is, can you bring up the science over there? Can you work with scientists over there or clinicians and say, okay, we'll partner with you, we will process your sample centrally, but in return, we will train your people to do some of this analysis. We will have some exchange programs and education so that they benefit as well. So at least in the epidemiology community, that's the benefit that people mm -hmm. can get. And it's not just taking samples and walking away. You have to benefit those people as well. <coughs> Jay has a comment. I just want to follow up. Actually, there is a, so as Sham said, ethic, uh, equity working group that is specifically addressing these issues um, in, in areas that are underdeveloped and how to help train from the ground up. So there's a strong component within ACA that is trying to build up this kind of communities. And I think Musa will talk about equity tomorrow, working right? group tomorrow. Musa yeah. will talk about so, tomorrow, but we have the first meeting in Yes, we had London, our first right? strategy meeting in London, and I think the next meeting in Addis. Uh, yes. uh, in so Ethiopia. There's really strong efforts towards mm -hmm. diversity and equity. Yeah. So just to wrap up uh, the you know, 1.0 draft, actually Jay mentioned the other groups uh, integrating the data. Um, Holger mentioned one million cells. We heard about genetic diversity. Um, you know, given that the other groups are actually sampling around tissue, or at least, at least based on like what are represented for the gut atlas, we imagine others are doing like them, sampling throughout the gut. If they're doing that, how we sh how could we complement such data set as the IC community, right? Should we be replicating what they're doing across tissue and do a deep dive? Because they mentioned one of my favorite cell types, dendritic cells. Actually, Andreas also mentioned them. Like, should we be replicating this, but instead like doing a deep dive for these rare lineage? Should we be integrating their data and see what's the missing data? And that becomes 2.0, where we replicate and then do a deep dive. Any thoughts on that? Like, we shouldn't be doing what the other groups are doing. We should actually leverage the fact that you know, immune cells are shared across tissue and that these other efforts may be missing all the rare cell types and states. Any thoughts on how we should distinguish ourselves and do things differently so it becomes complementary? Or we should do more multi-omics analysis on these, you know, rare cell states because the other groups won't be doing it? Or do like Holger and like go after one lineage deeply? Everybody agrees? Maybe once we're able to integrate different data sets. So yeah, then we can the see. The bunch of data that we created, once we're able to integrate that well, we will naturally go deep, right? Because so we get also, <laughs> we can be, we'll be able to detect rare cell types and you get to just have enough data to go deep into certain mono tissues. And, so or, or what lineages. this 1.0 look like is us taking all of the data, 1.0 for these other organs, extracting the CD45 positive cells and integrating it. it. 
Is that 1.0 plus like what some of you guys are mentioning you're doing? Um, one thing I've heard multiple people mention that I think could be really distinguishing is looking at immune cells under specific perturbations, which are likely to be lacking in the other cell atlases in the context of like different organs. Okay, well, that you kind of planted this, which was like, should we do <laughs> diseases, like immune disease? Is that what distinguishes us? And should disease be part of 1.0, which you know, some of you are already doing, we heard, about um, rare uh, immunodeficiencies in pediatric patients and cancer. Is anybody has opinions about if disease should be part of 1.0? Is perturbation key in defining the IC? Yeah. Uh, one thing in particular I was thinking about is the effect of persistent viral infections on the immune system and how that alters their function. Things like CMV can have pretty profound effects on the phenotypes of these immune cells. And so if you're going to say it's normal, do you call a CMV positive donor normal or not, right? And at what level do you start shaving away, you know, all eight herpes viruses and being like, okay, this is like a normal level of herpes viruses and things like that. Um, but, yeah, I was curious as to what the thoughts were on kind of separating based on, you know, that person's virome um, exposures. So, so you're the second person to bring this up, right? Like the actually third person about like this in-between phenotype between like a normal, normal and like an acute disease, like the in-between yeah. the virome. Yeah, I mean. Also within disease uh, organs, you can see that the inflamed, for example, areas are looking one state uh, at one state and then you have the adjacent tissue that we at the beginning we thought that this is a normal tissue but now we compare it to normal samples and it's it, it is not normal yeah I guess any thoughts on perturbation yeah So oftentimes, once uh, all the states are really sampled, like all the different cell types and all the activation states that these cell types may have, actually one would, what one would be mostly interested in is how these change in proportion. And I think for this, actually, bulk RNA sec and cybosort is an extremely powerful approach. We've had very, very positive experiences with that. Um, so, so in my perspective, for an immune set, uh, for ICA 1.0, it would rather be important to cover all the states maybe complementing with like some deceased individuals so as to make sure to really have all the states covered but then perturbation and like uh, inter-individual comparisons can actually be very well done by bulk RNA -seq. anyone who hasn't tried out cybersort yet I would highly recommend doing it what you can do once you have prospectively validated your new cell type and state but until you've done that it's actually really hard to do that yeah, with high resolution so, so the validations, like identifying the states, I, I wouldn't, because like in, in really, really many of these disease cases, it's, it's like mostly activation states and their proportions changing and, and not so much new cell types being cre created. And, and I, I would like, I don't want to say anything here, but I think also between different ethnicities, it probably won't be that like not suddenly new cell types are formed. No, it's proportions. that proportions change. Yeah, so we can increase the... Um, scale of analysis through more cost-effective approach like flow cytometry or bulk, yeah. Um, so as much as I really appreciate the perturbation, I think if you do get into the realm of disease, you're really opening a lot of Pandora box. <laughs> Pandora box, <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, when you talk about disease, it's, you can list hundreds. Um, so where do you stop? And then when you are talking about building 1.0, um, you need some end goal. And mm -hmm. say, oh, let's just choose two type of disease, then that's really not satisfying either. I just feel like um, similar to like the Human Genome Project, where I uh, just built a, a reference genome, and then people will do their own sequencing and compare their SNPs to the reference genome. Um, so having that reference as a healthy reference, I think is very critical for 1.0. And then the community will start to do perturbations and compare their data to the reference data set. So having a, a foundational kind of common 
language for what is a healthy state as 1.0 is, I think, very critical. And just over time, people will add additional information with, their, with the diseased states. But we are profiling here immune cells. And by profiling only healthy, you might uh, miss yeah. the inflamed I, states. I'm not saying right. we should not profile them. What I'm saying as a, to, as a 1.0 atlas, we should just define uh, 1.0 as a healthy state. But, but would we, but it be a good reference? Because people might not find the, the state that they are profiling if we don't represent the inflamed states. Yeah, so I, I guess we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't, uh, we should, I'm not saying we should ignore them, but how do we define uh, 1.0 mm -hmm. is, is kind of what I want to get at. Is should we define it as a healthy reference? Mm -hmm. well, you know, I, I guess I, I know, no, maybe bit like bit to your bad. point, like maybe the appeal of jumping into disease will lead us to actually not do a proper in-depth analysis yeah. of normal. Yeah, I just, that, yeah, is that of, like yeah, exactly. kind of your point? It gets too big, then we will never reach the Okay, end. there's like the controversial feel point. For, All these hands are that. raising. I just want to ask a question. Maybe. Huh? Yeah. I just, my main question, this is something I don't know because I'm not officially... I mean, I miss some biology here, but to me, it seems like one of the challenges in the immune system is that uh, there are a lot of states that we don't observe in sort of steady state perfect health that are still healthy, right? Like there are inflammatory states that are part of healthy function that we would want to include in a quote healthy reference, but you know, we might not see them if we don't study disease because we might miss them, like they're hard to model. And if we're not using model organisms or something, they might be hard to capture. So, I mean, that's kind of bridging the healthy and... I, I think Jay's know. point was not to ignore disease, but to say that maybe we do a deeper dive in disease by 2.0 and 3.0 right. to kind of get to these additional cells. But my point is the way that an immune, yeah. cell, an immune cell functions is by having a response that then can return to normal. It doesn't necessarily lead to disease, right? It's... So uh, to your point, uh, you're even, you know? raising, the, and somebody else raised that point, or maybe that was you, about no. dynamic sampling, um, having several time points to be able to kind of be able to capture right. that. I mean, I think ideally we would have diseases that aren't diseases, you know? We would have, like, responses that then re return to normal or something like that so that you capture that function. So a different form of perturbation. So, yeah, I think you're right. We should, 1.0 should be about healthy. But to test the robustness of the healthy, I think in 1.0, like, uh, like people generating a sample from disease, should, those samples should be used to test out to the robustness of 1.0. Um, the same in, in all our experiments, if I'm not taking all my PBMCs from supposed healthy controls, there's such a huge diversity that I'm not getting much, even after batch correction or whatever. But then if I start integrated um, uh, patients, then all of a sudden the, the diversity is, is kind of shifting, um, shifting the focus of batch effect from like genetic, ethnicity to more what's normal and what's uh, not normal. So I think we should try to find ways when people are generating samples from different type of disease and we don't need to focus on disease but to test then if 1.0 is robust or not if we, if we incorporate those. So that goes back to your earlier point that you made about ha not having a single 1.0 version, but actually different categories so we can benchmark this. Um, I missed the beginning, so I might be out of place, but I wanted to ask, why do we need a definition of 1.0? I mean, other than having you know, people tell the, you know, the agencies that give us money, here we did it, we have 1.0. But I mean, for us, is it really something that we need? Because if we compare this effort to the Human Genome Project, I mean, the Human Genome Project did not finish, right? I mean, they started by sequencing one genome. By the way, it's still not completely finished. And only then they started you know, saying, oh, we actually need to do a couple of more individuals. And then they found that there's HLA structures and, and you know, community structures in the data. And, and the genome also changes in aging. And I mean, so, so Maybe the kind of definition that we need, and I think the big success of the Genome Project was the fact that there was a very easy to use tool 
that people could take their own data and kind of, like Aviv said, query against it. So maybe a definition of 1.0 shouldn't be, you know, a target of we've mapped out healthy, that's it. You know, everybody can go home, healthy is done. But well, rather a definition such as we have a tool that everybody has to put their data on, which allows for easy data integration. As reviewers in this community, we demand that, you know, data be placed there and data be, data be made um, available in context with other data sets and kind of generating that as 1.0. So I guess, uh, I, I, I guess you're putting the focus not so much on data production, but actually on data integration and being able to have a platform to make useful query. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that should kind of be a target because I don't think that it's realistic to say, you know, we've covered ethnicity, or we've covered age, or we've covered healthy. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's like saying we've solved biology, and, and nobody, I mean, nobody's trying to claim that. Well, I guess that brings us to the third point, which was exactly that, about harmonization and creating these useful tools, but... Uh, I think the analogy to the human genome project is very good. Even the Human Genome Project had landmarks and then there was a press release in a big meeting, I think with Bill Clinton saying that draft sequence of the human genome is now complete and so on. So I think the 1.0 of the Human Cell Atlas, I, we don't have to meet the current president of some, some countries, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I mean, you do want a landmark. And you, want, you do want to say this is our draft immune cell atlas and have a data freeze. And of course, there'll be versions after that that are more complete. But for the human genome sequence, it was at the draft point, it was said, OK, we are, this is an X percent complete human genome. And that's a reasonable place to put it out and have people query it, as you said. So maybe even for the ICA or the HCA 1.0, we can define some kind of metric to say, Okay, it's not complete, but this is, we're at this level, and that's good enough to say this is our draft uh, atlas. So defining the you know, key milestones we want to meet. But, but you're raising an extremely important point about you know, how do you get to that version, and how do we make it useful in terms of data harmonization and building visualization platforms and query platforms for people to navigate that data. And that was this point, which you know, I let Hefi yeah. discuss. Yeah, one point I think that may be different between the human genome and our problem here is that we don't hear necessarily have here this refer reference entity that we have with the genome uh, that defined by the evolutionary process and here the, the data is defined by a very complex regulatory structure or process that we are studying that the the whole idea of, uh, of us, our studies, and uh, it, might, it might be necessary to understand this process in order to, to define the right reference. Um, okay, so, but now we need to d discuss the more technical uh, issues of uh, integration. So we are generating data for in different institutes, uh, in different organs, and um, using different technologies. And uh, the computational challenge here is enormous. Uh, it's really huge, and uh, we need to integrate uh, those data sets in order to, uh, to get some insights. And we are very interested in hearing your experience on, on data integration. Uh, we can start from Dana's point uh, on, on this uh, magical tool that does not exist right now uh, for perfect yes, integration. Yeah, and if we need like a specific working group, task force group just for the ICA, that's you know separate from the HCA. But Jay had a comment. Yeah, um, so I agree. The computational challenges are critical. Um, just want to say that the discussions that we're having hopefully will lead to a data set that is highly usable at, by the community around the world. So I, I think the utility aspect about the human cell is should be very, very important. So having this reference data set that everyone in the world will be using and, and referring to 
their research. And creating that value, I think, is what we should really aim for. And therefore, having some sort of a release and, and, and communicating to the, to the scientific community about the value should be emphasized. It's kind of being going back from the previous discussion. Um, so hopefully, we will have some more uh, creative ways to integrate the data set so it can create value. Right. And defining some milestones of what's like a useful, sorry. Ut utility matrix. Utility. Matrix, yeah. Do you have any yeah. uh, in thoughts about what should be in the utility matrix? So, I mean, so, it, it, so I've been also part of uh, another consortium, a phantom consortium, and we have a metric of how many people download the data, how many people actually use the data and publish the data. And it, it just generally creates a number that is quantitative in a way that how valuable the data set can be. <coughs> so hopefully we will also and reach And then you, you, yeah. with the feedback, you can readjust yes. the main data set. Yeah. Yeah, we have somebody here. Yeah. Hi. That for sure is, the, I, from my point of view, extremely important issue. But unfortunately, we have some criticalities. I, I, as far as I know, we have no, let's say, standard computational tool in the end. And I think even worse, that we don't have a standard data structure in which you can dis distribute uh, data and metadata. Of course, uh, there are already, we have, we have, there are work on that. I, I saw the, the various uh, working group on the metadata and so on. But the problem is that until we don't have a standard data structure, it's going to be extremely difficult to make uh, let's say comparable analysis, especially for what concerns the insertion of metadata that actually are describing the way you have built your experiment, how you set all the possible interesting parameters. Of course, metadata can evolve, but it's more than the, the table itself. It's the metadata that is going to be extremely important. I mean, some of the challenges are actually, they're brought to all HCA, which is what you're describing, and some of them are actually specific to the ICA because Actually, some people have mentioned resident cells versus circulating cells, and, and Andreas was mentioning how some cells may be shared across organs. So these are like specific ICA computational problems in terms of defining states, which you know, Sam also commented on. Any thoughts on how we could best approach harmonization? All, yeah. All your experience. Our, our experience. So, um, first of all, the comment uh, that was made about the uh, metadata and so on, this is definitely a very important point. I know that the DCP uh, of the Mercedes Atlas is working very hard on this, and um, I guess we'll see, you know, in the, in the coming year or so, when people start to deposit in, in, in mass their data, um, how that can coalesce into something that is useful. Right? Currently, it's, it's a little bit fluid in a sense, but, but I think that's one of the very important points for sure. Um, about the question of harmonization, so I think, um, to your question right here, um, so I'm coordinating one of the seed networks, um, and we have this experimental design that includes multiple age groups, multiple tissues, multiple cell types, so a cube, if you will, uh, all of them in, in one single data set, and of course, the one thing that I'm worried about the most is the uh, confounding, or in a sense, the differences between individuals, some subclinical, some not, CMV, others, uh, that will maybe uh, even um, have a stronger signal than, than the age, right, and so on, right? So, so that's a big deal. And as a computational person, I think about it as, okay, what is the goal? The goal is basically to query some data set against this reference data set and say, oh, this is unusual. Um, and as a computational person, I think about it as making very uh, conservative statements, right? Of seeing like, what is the best that we can say? What is our confidence margins, right? And uh, it's, it's very challenging. And we're trying to be as conservative as we can, but definitely this is the, uh, uh, the, the biggest concern in, in this kind of effort, especially when, when the N or the number of donors is fairly low. So um, in your case, you're using an experimental, I mean, you're doing computational modeling, but you're, you're tackling it in the context of a specific experimental approach where um, several tissues from the same individuals are being connected, collected, which may empower you more easily to figure out the overlap of cell states across. In tissues. might, but then still you will have these differences within the donors. 
uh, that would be hard to, um, to account for, right? And, and when you start accumulating those differences, you need a lot of donors to actually be able to make statements that are... Uh, so, Nir, is it hopeless for 1.0 to be able to define common cell states like no, I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's... Because uh, of not so enough no, no, samples? No, 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 not at all. I just think that uh, we think about it in a conservative way. Okay. That's all. Yeah, and that's why we have, for example, the, the genetics uh, consortium, where, so yeah. we profile blood as well, so yeah. we can say, okay, if we can make statements up to a certain confidence margin, what happens if we look at this much, much larger data set in terms of... So for our first draft, we should be a bit more conservative to try to figure out overlap. And as we increase sample size, you're saying but that we're more likely... Actually, but I think it, I, that it yeah. might be difficult to define what is conservative here. Absolutely. Uh, so, so you can be you, conservative. If, if you ignore the differences between patients, are you, like, are you con consider yourself conservative or not? So, or maybe you should <laughs> report th th those differences. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have a solution for this yet, but I think uh, with people in my institutes, other groups, like computational groups, are trying to, within each experiment, to try to define uh, the identity of each cell based on molecular criteria, right? And then once you've defined the identity of your cell, then you can start putting your cells in other data sets because, and if in o every experiment you, you're attributing a cell identity, then you can start mixing all the cells together and somehow it looks like you're kind of removing away much of, much of a batch effect. So maybe one direction could be to try to define criteria that could, within each experiment, define a cell identity and then once you have those criteria, then you could start playing with the cells and put your cell within whatever data set. Um, I guess you're tackling the question of how do we it define... Yes, but, but, but I think those two questions are, are needs to move in parallel. Um, I do think if trying to integrate mass, like massive amount of data and try to do just one big processing, you know, as I don't think there's a magic tool yet, so I'm afraid that we could lose a lot of information and, oh, and, and we don't know what conservative means or should we be conservative, should we do batch effect or not. So maybe one way would be to everybody, like each experiment we extract the potential of each cell within the experiment and then after that we can gather yeah. everything together. It leads to another question, it's like, do you think that we should run a single pipeline? or all sample, or maybe different people should run their own, like, yeah. different pipelines so on the same samples and then compare the results, like... Yeah, I would say, I think that there's no way to know unless we're trying to do... We could try to do both at the same time, right? We could try to have people running their own experiments and trying to get their cell ID, and then in parallel process all those data with one single big pipeline, and then we could start to ask, does that matter? Do we see big differences or not? Because I guess at the moment, I mean, s some of us are trying to do things, but it's a lot of speculation, right? So, Nir, you're talking about setting up a null, right? Just trying to get a sense of what the null distribution is across people. So then that seems like the right thing to do is to get lots of people initially. Yes, okay. Just trying to clarify what I understood, and then, and do you think? Do you think for me it seems like this issue, like we don't necessarily have to collapse into a discrete categories initially. We could also just think about getting multi-dimensional distributions of whatever cells there are. You know, as long as everyone uses the same sorting strategy or something like that. I mean, as long as there's some established benchmarks about what the sample is, you could just refer. You could at least maintain sort of a notion of the multi dimensional density, right, of, of you actually measuring genes and cells and you have a multi-dimensional density and you can look at how that varies across people. I mean, that's your true null, really, right? Like, then you... So, Sam, how are you, know, you defining a cell state? I'm not, you I'm, not, I'm not doing that initially. I'm just measuring what does the landscape look like over lots of people. I'm not saying that we shouldn't for specific s studies. But I'm just saying, initially, I don't have to categorize it. I'm just trying to measure what this density looks like so that it's a null, right? So that I have some idea of what it looks but, like in various dimensions. But maybe dimensions. your average would not exist, right? So right, the average might not exist at all. You need, you're absolutely right. You need a notion of the real density. Like, you can't, 
uh, you need an actual notion okay. of the distribution, right? And how right. that distribution looks across people and, and how much it varies in various and, dimensions, and right? Maybe the correlation between different cell types or subtypes. So. I, yeah, I mean, it's very high dimensional if you actually take into account everything. But my point is that it seems like useful to, I think we could, we could do categorization and cell typing, and I think that's also really important because for certain kinds of questions, you have to have those answers. But it would also be good to think about just trying to measure th these distributions. Like, what do they, wh what does the density actually look like? The high dimensional density, what does it really look like? What does the real null look like as much as we can get it? Because then, mm -hmm. you know, we can measure difference from that null, maybe. I mean, we won't know what is a technical artifact until we measure a lot, right? Yeah, That's the whole point of that. Yeah, we know already, for example, if you take the same, uh, the same library generated the your NGS single cell library, and then you run it, you run it on two different flow cells of Novasec, you're going to introduce some bias and quite some batch effect that you would and there are tools that are trying to correct for that. Right, but we have no idea how that, I mean, that's metadata that should be stored with it, and we really have no idea how much that compares to all of the other kinds of things that introduce effects. That's all I'm saying. You know, we, we don't have a sense of what the contribution is re in a relative sense because we just haven't had that data. No, but the, the same no. example is you sequence in two different flow cells, so all the difference you're going to see are going to be due to this technical artifact of sequencing. So we have, we have already... Right, we can measure that relative to nothing, but not relative to the population, not relative to, say, differences. Okay, anyway, we can... Sorry, you want this back here. No, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm no, just no, saying, no. I, I, totally, I totally agree with you, <laughs> except that before that, we need to solve a question of uh, data integration and or bias due to pure technical artifacts. And there's quite some that we're already aware of and we can measure, we can have proportions of their impact. I, uh, that's great. I very rarely see really strong bias due to like that isn't correctable, that isn't easy. The, the stuff that I deal with that's really hard to correct is often confounded with other kinds of bias. So that's what I'm used to thinking about. I totally agree with the technical bias needing to be here. Let me give it you. That's a good argument. But uh, I think the question posed there is very good. How do you integrate data from <laughs> thank, thank many you. different places? <laughs> I, I, as someone who's tried to do it a little, I'll say, I for myself and maybe for the community, I don't think we know the answer. So what we really need to do is, because I don't even see so many publications pulling data sets from many different places and harmonizing them. I mean, you know, there's the MNN paper, there's the CCA paper, there's some follow-up papers doing similar stuff, and they can show that for these specific data sets it works, but then we all have our own data sets or our collaborators' data sets where we know that it did not work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I think we just need to study this more and say what are the limits and what are the conditions. At the same time, I'll also say it's not, maybe it's not as bleak. The most spectacular places where it doesn't work is when you have patient-to-patient -patient variability. But if we're just talking about healthy and, you know, acknowledge that healthy may be a fuzzy concept, uh, but, you know, good quality data from relatively healthy donors, uh, analyze the right way, let's say, with best practices, it may not be so bad, the batch effects, right? So I, I remember, so once I asked my postdoc to give me a, an example of batch effects just before I was going to speak at a conference, and then he was not able to show anything very spectacular. I said, what happened? We've been worrying about batch effects for so long. How come you can't show batch effects and in integrating two different data sets? And it was just that methods have improved. So if you throw away the really bad data sets, you do your normalization a good way, you do fe a good feature selection, you do the clustering the right way, actually batch effects can be minimized quite substantially. So I think the f it's not totally bleak, but, but the field just needs to come to start doing this kind of integration on a large scale and then we'll start to understand uh, where, where, how far it can go. So to your point, we haven't tried hard enough to kind of see so. the real challenges, which may prompt new methods development. And so. to Jay's so. point, if like the one point always focus more on healthy, we may not have to tackle such big problem, but we will once we get to patients because it's going to be biological variability. So, I'm, so really, we, yeah. I'm really curious if people here were, for example, using samples that were generated in, in another lab or publicly available, available and could integrate it with their own data and analyze it 
properly. So, so a little bit. This is not. This is anecdotal and this is secondhand, but integrating, for example, three prime and five prime single cell RNA seq data is very difficult. It's it's just profound technical variation. So at least, but if we can at least get to the point where we can integrate data from many labs that were generated with the same protocol, and I think that's doable. But let's start with that. Yeah. So. I think you can, yeah, you can always integrate data from different places or even different technology, right? You're going to be able to integrate and have something at the end that looks like everything is integrated, but the trade-off is the more um, different your, your samples are, the more information you're going to lose uh, during the integration process. Um, so maybe for like uh, to build a healthy uh, atlas, Maybe that could be fine. That would mean we will not be that precise. But if we don't want to be that precise, then we can start integrating. Um, but definitely, for example, if you, when you compare healthy to disease, you know, when you start integrating, sometimes you identify within your experiments a cluster of cells that are only composed of cells from patients. And then we try to integrate with another data set, perform on another chip, and then all of a sudden we are losing that population. Why? Because the, the, um, the genes were too different. The early variable genes were not found in the other experiments, and so they've not been taken into account for data integration. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, any thoughts on how to tackle this? Because so right, I'm looking. I'm waiting for the magic tool. But <laughs> no, right now, what we do is um, then we do ask a question per experiment, mm. and once we've identified the cluster of pathological cell with a pat uh, molecular signatures, we do ask we within another experiment, if we use the same pipeline of analysis, can we find the same pathological cell cluster and all the molecular signatures are comparable? But that's very conservative. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, referring to integration, we were already start worrying simply to the change of the protocols because uh, protocols change in an extremely fast way. So, for example, we had the possibility to compare the version 3 of uh, 10x genomics with the version 3.1 with the same, uh, I mean, same experiment repeated twice. Of course, that is not exactly the same experiment. I mean, it's not too bad, but even since it's just a, a limited changes, uh, you don't get exactly the same stuff. Okay, it can be corrected uh, with vector correction effect, but simply because we know that it is exactly the same stuff. So, what and that, that means that protocols is going to be a very critical issue in general. What we are actually trying to do, but we have no magic solution up to now, is try to get rid of directly of the numerical data referring to the gene and move into higher dimension information, like say pathways and uh, other kind of, uh, let's say, general definition of uh, sub element of the cell that would easily make uh, a more stable the overall picture, but I mean, we are still trying to find a solution on that. That's similar to what Dana said regarding like comparing programs or uh, covariance matrices. So, what's the conclude, concluding thoughts on this? Um, like, you know, to the point that human healthy should not be so hard, but we haven't generated enough data to actually know, or, or that we need actually to just use a molecular definition and not give specific names. But maybe we will never generate enough data. So I think that our data currently is, is actually very encouraging. And uh, we see we can replicate uh, states of immune cells between organs, between labs. We have some technical issues that will be resolved with, with time, I guess. But, uh, so that's the concluding thought? That's mine. <laughs> I guess we have about 10 minutes and we can discuss any topics, but some of them include like what should we do moving forward? And it was highlighted throughout this two hours that there's some issues that are specific to the immune cell atlas community. Um, whether it comes from trying to integrate these data, do we need like a separate working group that kind of tackles bring together the data from these other organ uh, effort together with our in-depth analysis? Um, should we consider having our own separate meetings? It doesn't need to be physical. It could actually be vir virtual to better synergize. Uh, there are some groups doing lineage-specific efforts. Some are doing more broader uh, tissue analysis. There might be uh, some are doing specific uh, modalities of measurements like RNA. Some others are doing special omics. There might be beautiful opportunities to synergize here, whether it's also age group or you know, ethnicities. So are there any interest 
for finding ways for the IC community to gather beyond Slack channel, which, you know, has its limit. Any thoughts? I think it would be useful. Holger, do you think it would be useful? <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> uh, I think it would be great to have ICA specific <laughs> meetings because on the ICA meetings, we basically tackle strategies. No? It's, and the ICA, ICA meetings might be useful to present results, unpublished results, uh, discuss challenges, and really look at data and data sets. And to see what people are actually uh, producing. By show of hands, are, would we people be it. interested? Okay, we have like, I want to say, write down the majority. 50 per, please count, <laughs> quickly, quickly. 90%. <laughs> um, what about like, you know, there's of course the DCP and their wider effort to integrate the data, but there are challenges, as Effie and others have pointed in terms of, and uh, Nir and Sam have highlighted in terms of integrating the data. So uh, for the biologists to be able to kind of query the data and help with annotation, a bit like uh, Peter showed us on his... Uh, amazing futuristic portal. It's not so futuristic, but portal. Uh, should we have one that's a bit more specific for the immunologists? Because immunologists have very strong opinions about, you know, based on the, all the legacy knowledge. So do people think there's a need for thinking about more IC-specific portals and annotation tool thoughts? Do you agree, Andreas? Yeah. I mean, for immunologists, I think it would be... It's on, right? It would be extremely useful to have it connected to a flow phenotype because you know that's what Good. people yeah. do yeah. Uh, since 30, 40 years, right? Yeah, 30 years, and um, so that would really help in that portal. Mm -hmm. the, the point is how to do it. You have to move to a plate based approach or you have to incorporate the site seek. Site seek. That was to Bertrand's point where like there might be an opportunity as a community to define a more broader panel that everybody could use and that could get to this point of integrating all the data. Maybe it's more 2.0 than 1.0, whichever version we call it. But I think you're, I completely agree. I think the broader immunology community could better relate to the data and help annotate. I think it would in terms of uh, your metrics, this would like get skyrocketing metrics because people can finally understand the data even though they maybe no have, have no uh, bioinformatic uh, background. So Jay, that's how you get high utility metrics. <laughs> Any other thoughts, usefulness of a specific IC portal? I mean, I agree with Andreas, but I think and, um, and making sure we actually involve the immunology community that has all the legacy knowledge to annotate would be important. So it need to be user friendly. If I remember correctly, one of the declared kind of long term visions was to ultimately have a machine that does what people currently do by flow cytometry by single cell sequencing with a lot of additional uh, resolution and uh, obviously we are many years away from that but uh, in the same way as we are currently for very difficult cancer cases do exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing in routine clinical practice as kind of uh, the last resort essay uh, wouldn't you think that we are not quite far away from the point where you would want to do single cell or RNA seq on um, on disease cases as a diagnostic assay, and th that would say that one of the major applications of the version one or latest the version two would actually be to provide the reference against which you would then be able to annotate kind of clinic, like diagnostics near single cell sequencing data. I guess that's a good point, a slightly different from Andres. I'm, I guess I'll, I'll play the devil's advocate here. Uh, I, I agree, but at the same time, it's a cost issue because you may not be able to sample enough cells to get to the pathogenic cells that may be rarer than what you could capture within your 4,000 cells. And so it may not be at a point where single cell, single cell is practical, you could do it, but it's not cost effective right now to do to be able to get to some of the cell states, in some cases that may be too rare. But that's, that's part of the vision. I think, yeah, I have too many um, mics. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Yes, I agree for, like, um, we're not there yet to use single cell to profile all patients at the single cell level, but for example, what we are intending to do is to profile co some course of patients at the single cell level 
in order to extract new, new uh, biomarkers, mm -hmm. either being antibodies, qPCR, or things like that. And once you have those molecular signatures, then you could plug them into some online similarity algorithm, and then people could run those biomarkers or uh -huh. without doing single cell and try to map them back to the courts which have been profiled from which those biomarkers have been identified and then could say, this guy has some sign of inflammation based on his biomarkers. It looks like it could be this subtype of disease. And so I think that so we are not far from being able to tr try yes. to get into that. So you're saying using single cell uh, as, as, an, as, as a, a first approach to as get a new biomarker? Discovery <laughs> platforms to yeah. identify the parameters that are most informative and, and that you could use that for diagnosis purposes. And then use more mm. cost effective methods. Yeah. yeah. There's um, some. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, I remember that there uh, is a project named uh, Human Immunological. Uh, project right, and so there, there, there is a big platform about uh, different types of uh, uh, immune cells and the marker genes. But actually, I don't think the uh, the uh, types are very specific, and the states are clearly uh, described. So we we can refer some ideas of uh, that platforms and try to give higher resolution for the. Uh, immune cells. And because that was more flow cytometry and mass cytometry, what you're referring to, I think. That's why you're missing the resolution, but we could improve that resolutions with this new data. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah one thing that I, I, I'm still missing a bit is in this, everyone is talking about making a reference and, and, and just making a reference as, as we have the reference genome, no? but I'm still. I didn't capture from the discussion what the reference should contain. Look like. What does it look like? I think that should be the first point to start. Is it, is it, are we going to define uh, cell types and states? And can you use that then to, 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 to protect on disease. your own data? Yeah. I think that's a very key uh, issue to, to move forward. Yeah, no, I completely agree. We didn't get, I guess, if we all follow Holger's um, guidelines, we need one million cells <laughs> and, <laughs> and take the data from all the other organs yeah. to try to see what we're capturing. And based on Aviv's <coughs> comment this morning, they find a statistical threshold I want to compare to capture all existing st cell states and types within a certain range, so let's say 5%. And and I, I did make a point earlier, but nobody commented back, which is, you know, these other disease organ efforts are doing really good anatomical sampling, or we believe they are, but they're not doing deep dive for all of the immune cell types that may be more rare, which I believe we should be doing. That should be the responsibility of the ICE group, because otherwise these lineage will not be properly captured. Um, but, yeah, concluding thoughts, you want to... Yeah, we have two more minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, and I found that uh, for, for many people, we are not familiar with the um, uh, gene functions of the uh, immune cells. For example, we observe some uh, uh, expression of the macro genes. We cannot uh, uh, know the, the exact meaning. Like the macro so, RNA, yeah. Yeah, so maybe, maybe we, we can build a, a database or, uh, of the specific to immune cells and for, for some markers. And after we observe a marker of, of a, uh, a cell type, we can try to figure out uh, the uh, function, function of specific uh, uh, immune cell type. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. one last comment? Yeah, I just want to give a quick word from the perspective of the DCP. Um, we have current metadata schema. We have a uh, portal, uniform processing pipelines. Uh, we would love to engage with each specific organ community to understand if um, the needs of the ICA are not met by the metadata schema. Is it possible or is it um, appropriate to expand um, the metadata schema? We, what we have now is trying to capture a lot of, um, trying to capture like all the HCA data and so we may not have specific metadata that's important to the ICA. So please engage with us um, about that or the analysis. And uh, of course, it, there may be a point in time when it does make sense to have an immune-specific portal. But please 
uh, engage with the DCP. We've got about a dozen of us here. Um, so how can we best mandate. engage with you beyond the meeting? Um, we have, uh, we can direct you to the metadata working group. Uh, specifically, we have pipeline working groups. Uh, d it depends on which aspect. Okay. Um, but we have a, there's the help email. So we start with the help email and somebody can yes, direct we'll you to Yes, we'll get you place. to wherever we need to, to point you to. So with that, thank you all for participating. Um, given that at least 50% of you were interested in a form of an IC virtual group, I think we should look into it as a way to continuing this discussion. Don't go too far because there's a group picture and little bird told me it's here. Holger, it's here. But just at the beginning of the next session. We have coffee break now. Okay, sorry. We'll coffee break now and then at the beginning of the next session we have the, the group picture. But, just but also you in the auditorium. Yeah. Yeah, to you guys. Thank you.